ETH Podcast is back after a short summer break, just for you. Hey there, I'm glad you're listening to the ETH Podcast. I'm your host, Jennifer Kakshuri, and these are my guests today. My name is Julia Vogt. I'm an assistant professor at a computer science department. The focus of my research is on bridging medicine with computer science, so my application area is medicine. And together with my group, we develop new machine learning techniques for clinical data analysis and precision medicine. I'm Fanny, Fanny Yang. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Informatic at ETH Zurich. And I work on machine learning problems that are both relevant to applications and some of them are more geared towards the theory and understanding aspect of algorithms that people use in practice. And in practice for medicine? Currently, it's not completely tailored to medicine yet, but I do have medical applications in my mind when I pick problems. We're all connected via video conference. Both of you work in the same field. Funny, you're working in the computer science on a more general level, on a theoretical level, you, Julia, on a more practical level for medicine. How did both of you get interested in what you do today? Maybe funny, you begin. Yeah, so as a child, I actually um, always wanted to become a doctor. And then I started also to be interested in, in physics and math later on. And so I picked electrical engineering actually as my first major and gradually from there, I always had it in my mind, I want to do something to you know, make people suffer less. <laughs> that was usually uh, my, my main motive back then and I'm still, I guess. So during my master's, I actually picked a research project that is really close to computational neuroscience, actually multiple projects. And during those research projects, I actually realized I really wanted to understand why the algorithms were working because I felt like sometimes they were maybe not actually working that well. So I wanted to dig deeper so that when I have to use them again, I actually know um, how to assess and evaluate how well they work. And so that's how I got into the theoretical track of, of machine learning. And so that's what I pursued also during my PhD. And it seemed to me back then to be a perfect field, both that I can at some point in the future, apply what I learn to, to medicine, but also it kind of satisfied my curiosity to understand things better mathematically. And so it was a good intersection between um, application and, and theory for me. And so uh, I jumped into this during my PhD. And now I'm just basically, yeah, continuing um, along those lines um, of research that I also did during my PhD and postdoc. And what was it with you, Julia, that you landed in this field? So I was always very interested in medicine, but then I decided not to study medicine, but math. So my background is in mathematics. And then I did my PhD in machine learning, still on the more theoretical side. And then I wanted to become more applied. So I did my postdoc in a cancer hospital in New York City. And there I started to work really applied on medical data and to develop new machine learning techniques for these medical problems in very close collaborations with uh, medical doctors. And this I, I liked a lot, that the methods I develop might be used in practice and might benefit patients in the end. And I think this combination of machine learning and medicine is what I liked really a lot. So for me, this is the perfect combination of theoretical and applied work. I'm very happy that I kind of closed this loop of having a real interest in medicine, but not studying medicine in the end. But through my studies with mathematics and machine learning, I kind of now work on real medical problems with my mathematical and computer science tools. And we develop tools that can be of assistance to medical doctors in decision-making processes during daily clinical routine. If I understood correctly, both of you had the aim of making people suffer less. Like that was one of your motors or one of your motivations to do what you're doing now on a simple level. I mean, I know it's more complex than what you do. How do both of you collaborate? 
I just started in, in January, so meaning I was also teaching uh, my first semester. So uh, we haven't had that much time yet to really um, carve out a concrete problem, but there's definitely a lot of overlap. And I think for me, it's really great to have um, like Julia and also her other colleagues in the medical informatics domain in our um, institute, because I'm not that familiar with the concrete problems yet that people are facing in, in medical informatics. So for me, it's great to you know get some inspiration there, maybe also to think about some theoretical problems and maybe the theoretical insights could also help um, the biomedical teams or, or, or like the research group that, that are closer to applications to pick maybe different methods that they might not have thought about or maybe there's actually a, a really a way where the, the theory um, folks can actually come up with something new that that uh, practitioners can use. I mean, there's like a, I think being so close together in this institute is really a great opportunity for this kind of collaboration. But we still have to have some more time to to you know to talk and then then to start really collaborating on a more regular basis. And Julia, if I understood correctly, you collaborate with the hospitals directly. Like you take the models and you you use them to analyze certain things. Can you give us some examples of what you look at with machine learning instruments? Sure. We have um, many different projects. I just pick one. So recently I've been collaborating a lot with children's hospitals, so where we look at childhood diseases. And one specific example is we look at kids who develop jaundice in the first days of life. So newborn kids develop jaundice is very common. This happens usually in the hospital. And if it's detected, it's not a problem at all because um, the medical doctors detect these diseases and treat it. However, recently, the tendency is that mothers and their kids are sent home at the same day of giving birth. And now the fear is that the kids are sent home and at home they develop this disease and it's not detected. So then the, these kids can really have difficulties for lifelong. So this should be avoided. And there we developed a tool that can detect very early on the first day of life if this kid has a high risk of developing this specific disease. And this can help then the medical doctors to make a decision. Should we keep this kid a little longer in the hospital or can we send it home safely? And um, this is the first step of going towards a decision support system. So we are not there yet. This is a very long process. But these are research tools which can be used in the clinic on a daily basis. And is it hard to collect the data? Because as far as I'm uh, informed, you need to collect a lot, a lot, a lot of data to make a machine really learn what you want it to learn. So I'm not collecting the data myself. This is what our collaborators do in the clinic. And this is also where um, machine learning comes in. And this is also one of the potential projects I talked about with Fanny. So um, often data is collected at different hospitals and in different countries. And usually we cannot just combine these data because they are collected at different machines and those machines are different. So there is like... Um, a step in between where we need to develop models for domain adaptation that we can all these different data sources without introducing bias into the models. And these are all questions which we could look at. Fanny, what are your hopes and what are your obstacles that you try to leave behind? I guess on a high level, a hope would be to actually have uh, my work have impact on maybe the diagnosis or the treatment of of patients, but that's a long way to go there. What Yula talked about is actually one of the concrete research questions I'm looking at at the moment is if you have data from different environments, uh, from different regions, it could be in the world or from different populations, all kinds of differences in the data that you collect, how can you kind of learn something underlying all of the data that can, um, you know, lead to a better, say, diagnosis or treatment. So, so kind of on a lower level, that's my hope, is that we can actually leverage the amount of data that we have in a lot of different environments and learn uh, somehow more effectively from them instead of just throwing them into a, a model, for example, neural networks that many people use nowadays, uh, because they're vanilla approach doesn't work that well yet for the medical domain. So it's a huge field, I assume. And what are the limits? I mean, when you speak to people who don't know much about machine learning or about artificial intelligence, there's always the fear of 
oh, robots are going to replace doctors or machines are going to replace people. But I mean, I'm, I'm sure that there still are limits and, and which are the main limits? So um, there is, um, of course, the fear that robots take over. But what machine learning does is we, we assist medical doctors. So we are not replacing, we are assisting and we are trying to help in decision making. And machine learning is no magic. So this is something that um, one needs to be aware of. These are mathematical models, uh, formulas that are trained with computer scientists. And it's not magic that's happening here. So there are always humans behind And we are not trying to replace physicians, but we are trying to help them and improve the decision-making process and also to give them more time with the patient. So if they, for example, do not need to look at every image um, for half an hour, but only for a few minutes, because um, the algorithm tells them which parts of the image are the ones with the highest importance where they should pay attention to, then it just reduces time for them that they can spend with, with the patient more. Of course, we try to benefit the patient in the end so that they have uh, maybe better diagnosis, better treatment, less side effects. And these are the overall aims we try to pursue without replacing the medical doctors, of course. So I would actually say one of the limits is probably uh, both the data and the humans themselves, because the data is usually labeled by the humans and any bias that humans have will also be somewhat at least as we are using models now, will be reflected in the models that we learn. And so you wouldn't be surprised to actually have a model, for example, just to give an example, in the uh, biggest, one of the most standard image data sets, there's a lot of bias, for example, um, Asian Asians uh, play ping pong a lot. And meaning that most of the ping pong pictures you see of table tennis players Uh, they will be somewhat Asian players. And then if you look at basketball images, for example, uh, they will have a lot of African-American players. And so when you um, actually have an African-American playing soccer, for example, and try to predict that image, it's going to predict it to be a basketball player just because uh, they are African-American. So these kinds of bias are maybe not too severe, but if you think about political decision-making, etc., cetera, um, such biases can lead to pretty bad uh, consequences. And so what, what I'm saying is currently how we use data is still limited by, by human fallacies in some way. At the moment, I don't see how we can overcome human limits yet. So I think, uh, yes, as I totally agree with Julia, at the moment, it's more like I think of ML as assisting humans where, for example, uh, looking through a lot of data is just impossible in terms of time. Actually segmenting medical images takes a lot of time. And if the machine can already give you a template that is really close to the perfect segmentation, then you need less time to actually um, do the last bits yourself. And so things like that, I think, is also what I personally I think is the biggest use at the moment and I don't dream of like robots for me it's not that interesting to think about oh we can at some point have a robot that is smarter like and then what like I, I don't see how that should make people's lives better but machines can help the doctors to be more efficient more precise and maybe also see more things that they might not see if they wouldn't have the tools of machine learning or, or artificial intelligence they could also give the incentive to to rethink a decision so if a doctor makes a decision and the machine says something else so maybe just think about it again so why does the machine say something else is it um, a mistake by the machine or is it something i'm as a medical doctor have not seen so it's just like really just to double check And also what it is important with these algorithms is that what we develop in this medical domain, we need to be sure that what we do is interpretable and explainable to the medical doctors, because if they're not understanding what they're doing, if it's a complete black box, they probably will not use it. So we really need to be able to give some explanations here and some interpretability of the models. Yeah, I think another opportunity is um, like in, in, in regions where there's very few doctors, for example, in Africa, et cetera, I, I really find it intriguing that you can perhaps still have some diagnosis better than nothing, right? And so even though I, I'm not, in this case, it wouldn't be, uh, it also wouldn't be replacing doctors, but actually maybe like creating <laughs> 
doctors in some way. Of course, it's always better to have a human also involved and to, to see why the algorithm outputted this prediction. But if there's no one, I think it's also a good opportunity for ML algorithms to actually do good for, for people. And also in regions where they don't have really modern techniques or modern um, machines, sometimes we have models that where we can predict with the input of the modern machine and without. And for those regions where they don't have the machines, it's very important to also have the option to have the prediction without the machine because the machine might be very precise, like, a, I don't know, a modern fMRI machine or something. And if that's not available and you just have more basic data, then you can still improve your prediction with machine learning without having the access to these maybe really costly machines. Both of you only use the term machine learning or you say ML algorithms. Why don't you use the term artificial intelligence? Well, I think that has to do with what we said before, that we kind of feel that um, our work should benefit humans and it's maybe not that relevant to talk about intelligence here like having the whatever thing algorithm or machine be intelligent and i think this is more like a philosophical debate a machine could seem intelligent and still not be intelligent but is that really relevant to us and so i tend to shy away from using this term because i don't think it would really uh, lead to something concrete in my work that uh, would change Julia, with you, is it also a, like, is it out of caution that you don't use the word artificial intelligence too? Well, I think artificial intelligence is a, is a very wide term with applications ranging from robotics to text analysis. And originally it referred to the simulation of a human brain by machines. And I think machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. So for me, machine learning lies at the intersection of statistics and computer science and at the core of artificial intelligence and data science. And data science, on the other hand, is like a practical application of machine learning to solving real-world problems. So I'm going more and more into the um, direction of doing data science. So this is also why my group is called Medical Data Science. And I think machine learning lies at the core. Talking about machine learning, is it an issue that you're women working in that field? Of course, um, there are very few women in computer science and this should be changed. So, I mean, um, for um, higher diversity in this field, of course, we should increase the percentage of female computer scientists. And um, this is also why I'm involved in the CS Now efforts, which is the network of women in computer science at ETH. Our aim is to reduce the gender based barriers and prejudices and to increase the percentage of women who study computer science. So we have many efforts to motivate young high school students already to become interested in computer science because we see that the percentage of female students is already low and this percentage keeps on decreasing on all higher educational levels. And we need more female role models in these positions to show that you don't need to be male in this field. So there is no, no reason for that. And we also think it's very important to involve men in these processes, to involve men in these discussions, because to change something, of course, also males should be involved. And we really try to just reduce stereotypical thinking. I mean, anyone who has the talent and um, the desire to, to work in one field, they should be able to do it. And if it's because of the environment that's not inclusive, then we have to change something about Is that. it something that you were confronted with ever that people thought or gave you the feeling you're not as good as them because you're female? Personally, I haven't, no. But I have heard of others who, for example, they would say, colleagues would say, you only got in because you're female or you're only here because you're pretty. So this is things that people do hear a lot. And and even in very senior positions, they still hear that a lot. And it's very disheartening to hear that. And I hope, um, I don't have to, but I also don't know. Like it's in, in our department, I think it's a great culture. Um, but I don't think that's the, the same everywhere. And so that's, that's just the facts. Yeah. Julia, what's your experience? Um, I think here in our computer science department, it's a great atmosphere. And I hope that we can transfer this to more departments and 
in the complete computer science community. And it's not only in computer science. I mean, Fanny would know because she plays the violin on a almost professional level. The orchestras usually are conducted by men. And of course, if once there's a woman conductor, she has to speak about what it's like being a woman as a conductor and can she manage the whole orchestra and navigate. But Fanny is playing the violin on a professional level. Is that something that helped you also in computer science and machine learning and in your field? Or is it like a very different thing that just gives you a break from what you do? Oh, I mean, the experience of getting through pretty tough competitions when I was younger, it, it definitely helped for perseverance, right? So I learned really young that you get very high rewards when you have to go through really boring stages and stages where you really just don't want to do something, but you, you just have to sit down and practice. That, that That's when I was like 11 or 12, like when I was really just not feeling like practicing one or two hours every day, the same pieces for like three quarters of a year, for example, which I had to do once because um, the competition starts on the regional level, then goes to the uh, state level and then goes to national level. So then you're just preparing the same pieces for nine months or something. And then you really don't feel like doing it. But then um, I learned then essentially that persevering can give you a high rewards, not just For me, it wasn't just like winning a prize, but it was really like the the amount of progress that I made somehow without me actually noticing. So at the end, I kind of really felt like I um, made a big step towards maturity and musicality and, and things and technically also. That's something I think that stuck and that accompanied me throughout my life. And I think it's the same with sports, though, so it's nothing that special. Anything right, you do in, in childhood helps you. Right now, it's these two are very separate for me, music and research. And music, I consider more like, a, I wouldn't say relaxation, because too many people say like classical music is relaxing, which I totally disagree with. I mean, it can be relaxing, but it's not just for relaxing. Um, but it definitely gives me a lot of emotional stimulation, perhaps, a very resonant And you, Julia, you're a runner. Fanny mentioned sports could have the same effect. Does running help you focus on what you're doing or the other way around? Does your work influence your running routine? Um, well, I mean, I'm I'm not a professional runner. It's not as professional as Fanny is in her music. It's really what I do in my free time to relax. So this is really for relaxing. And I use running to get my mind off all other things that are going on. Sometimes I even have my best ideas when I'm running, actually. So I can't shut my thoughts completely off. But <laughs> yeah, but this is really for me what I do in my free time if I have, if I have time for it. I also have two young daughters and of course they take um, a lot of my free times. This is also what um, helps me to view some things differently, I would say. Let's summarize what we've spoken about and put it in this one question. What will you be busy with the next two, three years? So I will be busy with the next two to three years. So um, my theoretical problems are motivated by the medical domain and there are many challenges that arise. So what we have is we had a lot of different data types, a lot of heterogeneous data like images, text, genetics, um, clinical data. And most data is measured over time. So we have long time series with different time gaps, different length of the time series. And these are all questions that need attention and need to be tackled. And this is something that that I will work on in the next few years. And what about you, Fanny? I like pointing out limits of maybe human or artificial intelligences. So, so what I'm interested in currently is essentially trying to detect or help the machine detect itself um, when it doesn't know something. So for example, it's asked a question like, what is this picture? And the machine should say, okay, so I have seen data that looks like this, but I actually am not sure. And um, especially if it's, for example, from a region it hasn't had any data from, then it might be really wrong if it just tried to brute force predict what that image is, um, what it portrays. And so essentially, this is one of the main questions that are maybe describable to an audience, um, a general audience, uh, essentially trying to teach a machine to be humble and to know its limits 
And it's a hard question, but I think it's worthwhile because if we want to work with machines at some point, we really need explainability, but also reliability. So yeah, so this is uh, one of the uh, topics that I'm interested in for the next two, three years. Thank you, Fanny Young, and thank you, Julia Vogt, for joining me. My name is Jennifer Kakshuri, and I produced this episode of the ETH podcast together with Tis Wachter's Audio Story Lab and Luki Fritz, who is the sound designer. <laughs>